just a bit of introduction um, about, I guess, more about where I come from than me. Um, so I come from the University of Warwick, um, the School of Life Sciences. Um, that's based near Coventry, but actually I'm based on the campus at Wellsbourne, um, which we call Warwick Crop Centre. Um, and there are quite a number of us who do research on crops, particularly vegetables. Um, and that's mainly, I guess, because we were previously the National Vegetable Research Station and then um, HRI. And actually, uh, just before Christmas, we celebrated 70 years of research on vegetables on the Wellsbourne campus. Um, so our main focus these days is, is on reducing inputs into crop production, which might be pesticides, might be all sorts of other things. Um, also, Wellsbourne is the home of the UK's Vegetable Gene Bank, um, so the national collection of, of, of vegetables, if you like, and that's funded by DEFRA. Um, and just to say that within the university as a whole, we have a, a cross-disciplinary theme on food, so, so we have a, a range of interests in food. So, as Adam said, and I'm sure you know, the day has started in that way anyway, climate change is happening. Um, and what I've noticed increasingly is that almost every day in the news there's something about an impact of climate change. Um, and these were just two from sort of Christmas time. So climate change is leading to reindeer starvation in certain areas in the Arctic. Um, and obviously Australia and the, the fires. Um, so yeah, it's definitely happening. Um, so my, if you like, my source of information about um, projections, climate change projections for the future, uh, come from uh, a collaboration uh, which includes the Met Office and, and the Environment Agency and is uh, supported by a couple of government uh, departments. Um, and every so often they produce a new series of climate projections to, to indicate what they think might happen in the, in the future. Um, if we first of all think about the, the recent past, um, so what's happened in the last uh, few decades, then the average temperature over the most recent decade, so the last 10 years, has been 0.3 degrees C warmer uh, than the 30 years from 1980 and 0.9 degrees C warmer uh, than the 30 years from 1960 to 1990. So definitely uh, an increase in average temperature. Um, and then winters in the UK uh, for the most recent decade have been on average 5% wet wetter than 1980 to 2010 and 12% wetter than the 1960s to the 1990s. Um, and summers in the UK have also been uh, wetter, which I guess is sort of counterintuitive because I guess at one point people were talking about, about drier, drier summers, um, and that's by 11 and 13 um, percent respectively. So in terms of the projections for the, for the future, um, then in terms of um, temperature, then by the end of this century, um, all areas of the UK are projected to be warmer, um, more so in summer than in winter. Um, and hot summers are expected to become uh, more common. Um, so they, the temperature of hot summer days by the 2070s shows increases of, of between 3 and, and almost 7 degrees C under a high emission scenario. So that's, that's quite a rise in, in temperature. Um, along with an increase in the frequency of hot spells. Um, and also what they call hot spells, which is a period of, of maximum daytime temperatures exceeding 30 degrees C for two or more consecutive days. At the moment, they're largely confined to the southeast, um, but going forward, um, they expect that the frequency of, of hot spells and, and the, their occurrence further north um, will increase. So, say, I'm just going to provide a few examples and first of all to talk a bit about the, the effects of temperature on perennial fruit production um, and this is uh, based on some work that, that colleagues have, have done um, and I think one of the key factors is the fact that winters are getting warmer um, and so in the absence of effective chilling um, there are a number of, of crops, um, woody, I guess woody perennial fruit crops um, 
where if they don't get enough chilling, then basically flowering is, is impaired, um, which will lead um, to uh, poorer yields. Um, and this could have serious repercussions for UK uh, perennial fruit crops, um, but it might be partially compensated for by um, a decreased uh, number of frosts, because obviously in certain years frosts also impact on, on the yield of certain fruit crops. Um, and I guess one of the responses that, that might be made uh, to address this is actually to look at breeding uh, new varieties who, who don't require um, such a degree of chilling um, to flower properly. Um, another piece of work uh, that we did was about the effects of temperature on um, vegetable and salad production um, and again a number of, of example crops. Um, I start at the top with potato, um, so winter temperature, obviously potatoes are in store during the winter um, but higher temperatures in winter may cause loss of quality in ambient stores, so obviously the temperature will be, be higher. In terms of summer temperatures, then warmer summers in higher latitudes are associated with higher yields, so that may well be good, good news. Um, for uh, salads and leafy vegetables, then obviously we source winter salads from, from overseas, so, so the problem is, is elsewhere. Um, in terms of summer temperature, then crops develop more quickly um, at higher temperatures and mature earlier, um, so that's possibly good news. Um, yield increases for early season plantings will, will, in, will yeah, yields will increase for early season plantings but decrease for late summer plantings um, and premature bolting might impair quality and uh, in talking to salad growers when we were doing this work um, they uh, indicated that extremes which might be extremes of temperature too hot too cold um, or uh, extremes of, of, of water may also affect quality in terms of brassica, then uh, with crops like, like cauliflower, um, which require um, a period of cold to actually initiate the curd, um, then warm winters may actually completely mess up um, the scheduling that goes on uh, for continuity of supply. In terms of summer temperatures, then high temperatures can have negative impacts in a, in a range of, of ways. Uh, and seed production may also be impaired at high temperatures. Um, carrots, uh, warmer winters are unlikely to have an impact, though, although again carrots are, are stored in the, in the field under straw and polythene, so higher temperatures may lead to more disease problems, quality problems. Um, in terms of summer, then increased temperature um, has a positive impact on growth and yield, uh, and that's enhanced by elevated CO2. Um, finally, onions. Onions are in storage over winter. Um, increased temperature makes them grow more rapidly, um, but that is like to reduce yield, um, but that may be offset by elevated CO2. In terms of uh, wetness, then uh, projections say that despite the fact that there is likely to be an overall drying trend in summer, um, new data that they've generated suggests that the intensity of, of summer, um, well, there will be an increase in the intensity of heavy sum, summer rainfall events, so periods when, when large amounts of rain fall. Um, it also uh, project, they also project significant increases in heavy hourly, hourly rainfall intensity in the autumn as, as well, and I guess that's what we've been experiencing to a certain extent. Um, and yeah, projecting some other sort of extremes in terms of, of rainfall as, as well. Um, and I guess so, we're experiencing those sort of conditions already. Oh, good. Okay. So I, I personally think there are a lot of issues around rainfall. Um, too much, too little um, in terms of, of land preparation, sowing or planting, harvesting. Um, availability of water for irrigation when you need it, um, water logging effects on, on annual and perennial crops, um, and again all of those will lead to disruption of scheduling and continuity of supply. Now I move on to uh, carbon dioxide, elevated CO2, which is another um, impact of climate change, 
Um, and, and basically, these are positive effects. So the predicted effects of, of elevated C CO2 up to 2050 are to increase photosynthesis, so increase productivity of the plants, improve the efficiency of, of water use, uh, and that has the potential to increase crop yield, um, provided the other resources um, are available to, to the crop. Sorry, yeah. Um, Obviously, the ability of, of crops to actually benefit um, from elevated CO2 depends on uh, both species and, and variety, um, and some will respond better than, than others. Um, one effect of, of growing plants elevated CO2 is that they can have a different um, composition, if you like, um, so higher carbohydrates, lower nitrogen, um, so there might be some tweaking to do um, to maintain produce quality. Um, then there are uh, I think concerns about elevated ozone um, and I think it's believed that any increase in ozone in the UK is predicted to be, be small um, so it will have limited impact. I think the, the lettuce is thought to be one of the, the most susceptible crops to elevated levels of, of ozone um, and it causes um, high levels of ozone, ozone cost, cause loss of yield and of visible quality. Um, potato, there can be injury to the, the foliage um, but less impact on, on yield. Um, and carrot, um, it can, higher levels of ozone can lead to chlorosis of the leaves and some loss of yield. In terms of um, the effects of climate change on, on soil biology, then, and this is the, the FAO view, and some people in here may have other thoughts about this, um, but basically, um, they're suggesting that increased productivity of crops and of plants because of elevated CO2, elevated temperature, will lead to, if you like, a lot of biological, biologically beneficial effects um, from the organisms that live in the, in the soil. Um, and, for example, increased mi microbial and root activity um, would lead to increased rates of plant nutrient release from soil minerals, um, increased mycorrhizal activity would lead to better um, phosphate up uptake. Um, and these effects would be in synergy with better nutrient uptake during, due to the, the higher um, CO2 concentration. Um, and then in terms of soil organic matter, then if the plants are growing better, producing more roots, then that would lead to um, higher levels of soil organic, organic matter. Um, it's likely that the, the carbon to nitrogen ratios um, would change, uh, would be higher ratios, which would lead to slower decomposition, um, which might actually be favourable, provide more time for incorporation into the soil by, by earthworms, for example. Um, and generally, the, the thought is that the, the increased productivity and water use efficiency of crops and vegetation um, and the generally similar or slightly higher rainfall um, indicated by the models um, would lead to increases in ground cover and consequently better protection against runoff and erosion. However, you have to bear in mind that extreme events are still predicted to occur um, and those are likely to have adverse impacts on the soil. So now I'm just going to talk um, for the last section a bit about insect biology and the impact, potential impact of climate change. Um, and this is the area on which I've actually worked myself. Um, so what drives insect biology? Um, well, insects are cold-blooded organisms. So basically it's temperature that drives their rate of development. And the hotter it is, the, the faster they develop and that's within certain limits. Um, their survival can be affected if it's too wet or too dry. Um, some species have special adaptations to survive extreme conditions. And then you have to think about the natural enemies as well. They have a range of natural enemies. Um, and obviously climate change will also affect those. Um, but it's very difficult to sort of 
tease out what those effects will be, but, but climate change may well desynchronise um, some of the natural enemies with the pests. Um, I was going to just talk a bit about three pests of carrot on which I've worked. So um, I think these are the three main pests of carrot. So carrot fly, um, aphids and cutworms, which are caterpillars of um, the turnip moth. Um, and talk a bit about each and the likely impact of climate change. So for carrot fly, it's potentially quite complicated. Um, at the moment, it, in the southern UK, it has three generations a year, so if you like, goes through three, three life cycles. Um, the likely impact of climate change will be that the first generation is earlier. Um, the second generation may well disappear altogether because that's the hot, hottest part of the year and carrot flies can estivate, which is in their pupil, their chrysalis stage, if it's very hot, they just become dormant until it's cooler. Um, and then the third generation, um, which is in the, the autumn, uh, may become more significant. Um, and actually, we know that the, this is probably what is likely to go on, because um, this has already happened in southern France and in Switzerland in some years. Um, and generally, carrot fly won't do very well in hot places. Um, the next example are the aphids. And with the aphids, although their presence is a problem on carrot, um, it's actually their, uh, their ability to transmit viruses that is the main issue. Um, we, we think that it's probably the main species is the willow carrot aphid, but there's some AHDB work going on currently um, to work out which is the most important. Um, and I think what may happen is the way that the aphid overwinters may change. At the moment it overwinters a, as an egg on the woody host, on willow, um, and as a uh, years get warmer, it may actually continue development during the winter as an active aphid. Um, and obviously that will depend on whether it's got any host plants and whether with overwintered carrots it can actually survive um, when those carrots are covered with straw and polythene. Um, and again, it could migrate earlier in the, the spring. Um, there are other impacts I'm sure that aren't clear. Um, and the final example is the, the turnip moth, the cutworm. This is a sporadic pest in the UK um, and it thrives when the weather is hot and dry so climate change is probably um, something that will increase its numbers. Um, but small caterpillars are very sensitive to, to rainfall um, and that's a basis of a, of a current cutworm forecast um, that's used. Um, and earlier work that we did using the earlier set of projections, the UK CP09 projection, projection suggested that the incidence of damage um, would increase um, over the years with climate change. However, if there are going to be some more severe rainfall events, then when they do occur, um, they'll cause mortality of sensitive stages. So I just briefly wanted, because the, major, the other major issue of parrots is cavity spot, um, which is a, a, due to a, a pathogen or a number of pathogens. Um, and that leads to a loss of, of quality and yield. Um, and basically, we need to do a lot more to understand its, its biology in the, in the soil. Um, but we do know that um, incidence is exacerbated by wet conditions in the autumn. So one could expect that climate change might make that pathogen worse. And so to sort of wrap up then my sort of personal view about the severity of the impacts is that um, I think you know, a key factor is, is the, the wetness and the dryness, thank you, and um, which will cause the, I think, the most disruption to horticultural production, um, so continuity of supply, yield and quality. Um, I think infestation by some pests is likely to become more frequent, but some um, carrot fly maybe over time, if it gets really hot, um, may, may become less common. Um, the, the impacts on natural enemies are very hard to predict. Um, and one thing I haven't really mentioned at all is that we may become more um, susceptible to invasive pests and diseases because if they get here um, through on imports or on, under their own steam, then conditions may be more favourable for their um, survival. 
And in terms of, of potential um, solutions, um, then I think um, variety selection, uh, plant breeding um, is one way forward. So what traits, what useful traits have we got already in varieties and genetic materials? Um, and what do we need? Um, obviously that has a quite a long um, lead in time. Um, we should continue to focus on soil quality and health. Um, we need to pay attention to, to the detail, better understand the, the life cycles of the, the crop, the pests, the diseases, the weeds. Um, I think there's a whole important role for diversity in cropping systems, um, polyculture, field margins, agroforestry, all of that. Uh, which we need to understand a lot better and exploit it. Um, and then I think we need to think more on the landscape scale um, about pest and disease, disease management um, because yeah, what happens, sometimes it is what happens on an individual farm but more often than not it, it's what happens in the, the wider area. So just to, to thank my, my colleagues at, at Warwick who helped me with all this. Um, DEFRA actually funded um, two death study projects, which is what a lot of this is based on, um, that, that we did at Warwick with, with other, other colleagues, um, and then that led me to be able to contribute to a number of chapters and papers and things like that. So thank you. And then I'll pass on to Joe.